Good evening, St. Rest. How blessed of God we are to share tonight in Bible study. We will continue our series in the book of Nehemiah. Tonight, we will look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. I want to talk about a job well done. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. We'll pray. We'll read the scripture and then see what God has to say to us from what God has already said to us. God, our Father, we bless your name. We honor you for who you are and what you have done in our lives. God, we thank you for your word. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. With everything we're hearing in the news today, with all the reports from the White House, the CDC, with FEMA and those dealing with hurricane recovery, God, we thank you that your word prevails and your word stands over all of it. We're grateful for your word tonight. As we hear what you have to say to us, show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you'd have us to hear. Teach us what you'd have us to learn so we can be who you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Allow them to see and hear Jesus, not me. Let your word go forth with both accuracy and clarity that your people be edified and you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, for our time together tonight, we will look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. From the English Standard Version, it reads, So the wall was finished on the 22nd day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when our enemies heard of it, when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they had perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, And his son, Jehoanan, had taken the daughter of Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him and Tobias sent letters to make me afraid. Now, as we look at this part of chapter six, we finally see the culmination of the work Nehemiah led on the reconstruction of the wall. They finally rebuilt the wall. And as we have learned in this series, this finished work came with much labor. These men worked day and night tirelessly completing the wall. As we've learned in previous chapters, they had tools in one hand and a weapon in another hand, trying to ward off enemies and protect themselves as they were rebuilding the wall. And they were working shifts to make sure that nobody was left out and nobody was tired in the process. It came with much labor and it came with much persecution. We've heard the stories of Sanballat, We've heard the stories of Tobiah and Geshem, how they've done everything they could do to try to stop Jerusalem from rebuilding the wall. They threatened them, tried to send uh, letters against them. They tried to intimidate Nehemiah. They've done everything possible. But now we finally see the final product of the work that God called Nehemiah and this people to do. It shows the labor they worked and the persecution they faced were worth the final product because now their home is rebuilt. They're finally back at home, safe within their own walls. And I think that's important for us to remember today because some of you may feel like giving up. You're tired of the work, you're tired of the persecution that comes with doing what God has called you to do. But this part of the passage shows us that your labor and persecution will be worth the final product. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever destination God has called you to reach, it will be worth everything you're going through to get there. So really this text teaches us this lesson. God always blesses the work you do for him. God always blesses the work you do for him. Now that comes with a few contingencies. First of all, you need to have the right motive. If you're doing it for selfish gains, if you're doing it for your own personal agenda, you may get by, but you won't get away. 
God is not going to bless selfish work that is not bringing him glory. You have to have the right motive. Whatever you're doing in life, whatever work that you're trying to accomplish, make sure the ultimate goal is to honor and glorify God because God is not going to bless selfish work. You must have the right motive. You must keep the right momentum. There's going to be times where you feel like quitting, but you can't give up. You have to keep going. Because if God called you to it, he will give you the endurance to go through it. You must have the right momentum and you must remember the final goal. God never assigns you to something that won't yield dividends. God always blesses the work you do for him. So if you're doing the labor, if you are working in his vineyard, there will be a payday coming. So you must remember the final goal because God always blesses the work you do for him. And this text shows us what makes a job well done first of all god's timing is in it god's timing is in it let's look at verse number 15. the bible says so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month elul in 52 days the remarkable part of this project is how quickly they finished it this entire reconstruction project was done in 52 days not 52 weeks not 52 months 52 days and we're not talking about them building a fence around a house they're building an entire wall around a city now to give some context to it here in shreveport we've just learned that uh, Louisiana DOTD is going to rebuild the Jimmy Davis Bridge. It's one of the oldest bridges we have in our city that looks over the Red River. If you drive it, you'll be scared every time you go up because it's rusty, it feels old, it's cricketing. It needs to be rebuilt. Uh, the Department of Transportation just announced that they'll spend $100 million to upgrade the bridge, but they only expect to break ground on it within the next two years not finish the project, but simply break ground. And it's gonna take them two years just to do that. When you look at that project, compared to what these people in Jerusalem did, they completed an entire reconstruction of a city wall within 52 days. That remarkable fleet reflects God's timing. It lets us know God does not operate by our time, nor does he operate by our logic. If God is in it, he can make it happen whenever he wants to. So that's an encouragement for us tonight. Don't mistake time with God's timing. I know it feels like it may be a long time before something comes to pass. I know you're tired of laboring day by day and it doesn't seem like you're making any progress, but God can move both in the long term and the immediate. He can turn around whenever he wants to. And if it's a job well done, it will happen in a time frame where you can't help but say God did it. I'm willing to testify on my own. 2020 was a roller coaster year where it felt like everything happened so quickly. I was engaged. I was married. I was called to pastor and moved into a new home and got a new car in a matter of 12 months. And it happened in a way where I couldn't help but say God did it. Not because of anything that I did, not because of anything my wife did, not because of anything that happened on our own. We flat out can say God did it. And some people will say you lived a five year span in a matter of 12 months. And I would tell them you're right, because normally those moves are not made as quickly. But it proved to me that God moves beyond time and beyond logic. When I can't make sense of it, and when I can't understand it, if it's really in God's timing, it will happen whenever he wants to. So be encouraged. You know it's a job well done when God's timing is in it. He does not need a calendar to do whatever he wants to do. If God says he's going to do it, he can do it right now. That's why in the New Testament, when you look at several of the miracles that Jesus performed, the Bible uses this term immediately. Whether it was Jairus' daughter who was dead, the Bible says immediately she was risen from her sleep. Or if it was the man who was laid down in front of Jesus in the crowded house, it said immediately he received strength in his legs. God can move both in the long term and the immediate. So don't mistake time with God's timing. 
when God's timing is in it, he can do it whenever he wants to. So be encouraged. I know you've been waiting a long time to see God's promise come to pass. And I know you've been working a long time to see the fruits of your labor. If God's timing is in it, he'll do it in a way where you can't help but testify. Nobody did it but the Lord. So you know it's a job well done when God's timing is in it. You also know it's a job well done when God's hand is on it. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16, the Bible says, And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Now, notice the Bible says that all the nations, when they heard the wall was completed, they dropped in self-esteem. They lost their sense of confidence, not because the wall was done, but the Bible says they lost their confidence because they perceived they were able to accomplish it with the help of God. Even the enemies of Israel realized what they did was evident of God's hand being on their work. The enemy had to say that clearly God is in it. And that's how you know you're doing a job well done is when your enemies can testify to the fact that God is moving in your life. Now, when you look at the entire story of Nehemiah and this reconstruction project, throughout the entire book, the beginning of it, it reflects what Jerusalem knew all along. In Nehemiah chapter two, Nehemiah told those governors, God will help our hands. He will strengthen our hands to do the work. He says it again in chapter four, when he tells them, God will fight for us, that we need to remember the Lord who is great and terrible. Even in chapter six, at the beginning, he tells Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I come down to deal with you all when God is doing a great work in our lives. And here again, now we see the same testimony they had prior to the completion of the wall is now the testimony of their enemies where they can simply say, God did this. And that's how you know you're doing a job well done is when your enemies can recognize what God is doing in your life. And ultimately, that should be our goal. Our goal should not be to frustrate other people and brag about how well we're doing. Our ultimate goal should be to brag on God and show folks how great our God is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the premise behind Psalm 23 verse five. When we look at that scripture where it says, you make a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, you anoint my head with oil, you cause my cup to run over. That's not something for us to brag about. Because when you look at it, God set the table for both you and your enemies. Both of you are sitting at the table. It just so happens that your enemy gets to see how great of a host God is because he's now seeing how God can bless you in his face. So ultimately, when you talk about God's hand being in it, it should remind us that we're not out here to make folks angry, make folks mad and brag about how well we're doing. Oh, I've got this. I've got that. No, your job is to do the work so others can see clearly God's hand is on their work. God's hand is on their life. When you do that, you know, it's a job well done when your enemies can look at it and they can't even argue with the fact that nobody did this but God. So if you know it's a job well done, you know, God's timing is in it. You know, God's hand is on it. Finally, your enemies can't touch it. Your enemies can't touch it. Let's look at verses 17 through 19 of Nehemiah chapter six. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Jehoanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Now, here it is. After everything is done, Tobiah is still trying to make Nehemiah feel afraid. He sent letters in previous chapters. He's sent reports to him to try to intimidate him. And now that the work is done, he's still trying to send letters to make Nehemiah feel afraid. But this time, instead of it coming from the outside, it's coming from the inside. 
we learn in these verses, Tobiah has connections to the nation of Israel because of who he's married to. His marriage allows him to be connected to the children of Israel, which is something that Ezra has preached against at this time, that they're not supposed to intermarry because their intermarriages would bring other gods and other religions into their homes. But here, Tobiah has connection because of how he's intermarried into the nation of Israel. And he's still trying to make Nehemiah afraid by sending these letters through his family members to give to Nehemiah. But it's all for naught because the work is done. He's writing these letters, but it's wasted ink on paper because what God's promised has already come to pass. So Nehemiah has no reason to feel afraid because the work is done. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. So there's really nothing that Tobiah can do because it's already done. And friends, that shares with us, you know it's a job well done when your enemies flat out can't touch it. You can stand against your enemies when you stand on the promises of God. When you know what God has said and you have experienced God doing exactly what he said, your enemies can try, but they'll fail. They can try to intimidate you, but it won't work. They can try to make you scared, but you won't be afraid because you've witnessed what God has already said in your own life. Nehemiah was able to move forward. He was able to move on. He was able to go on about his business because what God promised him already came to pass. And he was more worried about seeing God's promise than being afraid of Tobiah's intimidation. And I can encourage you with the same. Again, you can stand against your enemies when you stand on the promises of God, when God has already done what he said he's going to do, there's nothing your enemies can say. There's nothing your enemies can do. They can't touch what God has already promised over your life. And that's not just true in a personal sense. That's also true in a corporate sense for the church at large and for the church locally. When we stand on the promises of God, there's nothing our enemies can do to touch what God is doing in the life of his church. That's why Jesus tells Peter in Matthew chapter 16, on this rock, I'll build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a promise the church can stand on and can stand against our enemies when we know as long as we're standing on the foundation of Jesus Christ, there's nothing our enemies can do to touch what God has already promised. That's why we sing the hymn, standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail. Because I'm standing on the promises of God. God, our Father, we thank you for this word tonight. Thank you for showing us what a job well done looks like. Help us in our labor to see your timing, to see your hand, and to recognize the fact that when you have given us your promise, our enemies can't touch it. God, we're praying that you would bless and strengthen our hands because we know that you always bless the work that we do for you. Help us to have the right motive that whatever we do brings you glory. Help us to keep the right momentum that we don't get weary in well-doing and help us remember the final goal that you will reward whatever work that we are doing for you. I pray this word God blesses those who are feeling like giving up, who are tired in their ministry, tired in the work. Help them to run on to see what the end is going to be and give them hope even in the now that in the not yet they will see your goodness and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank God for your presence tonight. We pray this lesson blessed you. If you've been blessed by what you heard tonight, as well as blessed by the ministry of St. Rest, we will encourage you to give as God lays on your heart to do so. Here at St. Rest, we have several methods by which you can give. You can give physically. We have a drop box available on campus where you can drop off your contributions, or you can also give electronically through Givelify, PayPal, Cash App, and Google Pay. Several methods of giving, but the same mentality. God loves a cheerful giver, and I am a living witness. You can't beat God giving. 
no matter how hard you try, because the more you give, I'm telling you, the more God will give to you. So if you feel led to give tonight, we'll encourage you to do so. And please know we'll be good stewards of what God blesses us through your contributions. And to those who are continually contributing to the life of our church, thank you so much for how you continue to bless us through your contributions. We thank God for you and the sacrifices of giving that you are making to bless us here at St. Rest. Uh, as we're getting ready to close, I want to say thank you to those who have made contributions to bless the storm victims from Hurricane Ida. You've uh, given tremendously through the donations that we requested this past Sunday. We've already got an office full of supplies, uh, clothing, and other things that we can give to bless those storm victims. So thank you so much. We will send that over to Mount Canaan this weekend, and that will be sent down south to Louisiana to bless those victims who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida. So thank you, St. Rest, for doing what you always do. You always come through in time of need to bless somebody else, and we thank God for it. I also want to make a quick note that we get excited about our church anniversary. It's the second Sunday of November. I know we got a couple of months away, but I want us to get excited now as we thank God for 136 years of his faithfulness here at St. Rest. More information will be coming, but let's get excited now as we're getting ready to celebrate our church anniversary on the second Sunday of November. I'm excited. I am grateful to God for what he has done in the life of our church and how he's continuing to bless us even during this pandemic. One thing can be said that God's hand is on St. Rest because St. Rest is moving forward even through these turbulent times. So I'm excited and I'm looking forward to our church anniversary on the second Sunday in November. As we're closing and coming to a time of prayer, I will invite you to comment and let us know how we can pray with you. We believe in the power of prayer here at St. Rest simply because of these three words, God is able. We know that God will hear us and he'll answer us according to his will. And we know he's able to do whatever we need him to do in our lives. So feel free to comment and let us know how we can walk with you in prayer. Because again, we believe in the power of prayer here at St. Rest. God, our Father, we thank you for this privilege of prayer that we can come before your throne of grace, find help in time of need. God, we lift those storm victims to you now, those who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida. God, you see the devastation that's taken place, how it may be months and even years before some people recover from this tragic storm. God, I pray that you would be with them every step of the way, keep their faith strong and let them know that you're with them. And God, I pray that you would bless our hands to be a blessing to them, that you will give us the resources we need to be an extension of your love and kindness towards them, that as we bless them, they see Jesus and how we treat them accordingly. I pray for those who are watching tonight, those who have commented with prayer requests and special needs and those who may not have commented, God. You know what's on their hearts and minds. You know what issues they face in their life. I pray that you meet them in their moment of need so they can testify about the fact that nobody but God met them in their moment of need. Whether it be finances, whether it be health, whether it be their relationships, whether it be things on their mind, trouble in their homes, whatever the issue may be, God, I'm asking you to meet them in their moment of need. Give them a blessing that only you can give them. Show them your power and glory that they may testify of your goodness. When it's all said and done, God, help us to have a heart of gratitude that says thank you for doing what no other power can do. For it's in that name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.